Thank you so much to all of you for joining. I'm Christina Canales Gorchinski, the Executive Director of Impact Austin, and I'm here to welcome you to Impact Austin's 2020 Town Hall Meeting. Our theme for this evening is Embracing Trust-Based Philanthropy. And tonight, we'll hear from national experts on trust-based philanthropy, and we hope to build trust-based philanthropy champions in all of our members, our local funding partners, and beyond. And one big other big announcement to make this evening is that Simone Tama Flowers is joining the Impact Austin Board. I am honored to welcome to the Impact Austin Board, Simone Tama Flowers, who is a class of 2018. Simone recently said that as an, a nonprofit leader, I love being an Impact Austin member, working on the other side of the funding pipeline and wearing another hat of philanthropist. I love that my one vote is just as important as anyone else's in awarding grants. Thank you so much to Simone for your leadership and welcome to the Impact Austin Board of Directors. Uh, this was a year that many of us feel so distant and divided and Impact Austin members continue to come together collectively because we are in this together. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Our evening was made possible by our event co-chair, Lauren Lewis and Deanna DeHaven, the team at C2C Media for the incredible video work. And a quick thank you again to our town hall sponsors, Robertson Stevens, C2C Media, Dochen Realtors, Enoch Kiever, Google Fiber, Bank of America, and our amazing board president, Susan Palumbo and her husband, John. And I now have the pleasure of introducing Mita Kothari, who will introduce our panelists. Mita is the Managing Director of Sustainability and Social Innovation at Macomb School of Business at UT. Mita is also an Impact Austin member, class of 2004, and is one of the first five Impact Austin members I met when I moved here. And highly relevant to this evening, Mita was the one who planted the seed for the Social Innovation Grant with our founder, Rebecca Powers, back in 2018. So welcome, Mita. We look forward to this thought-provoking panel of some female philanthropy rock stars. Thank you so much for moderating. Thank you, Christina, and thank you for your leadership. Uh, Impact Austin is in such great hands. It's lovely to be able to sit back and watch and join in for some fun once in a while. Um, I have so much to ask our panelists today, so I will not spend a whole lot of time um, but would like to introduce you just a little bit to our panelists. Uh, first of all, Dimpal Abhichandani is the executive director of the General Services Foundation. Dimpal is, um, is an advocate, is a, um, is a, a, a relationship uh, broker and a funder, educator, and uh, wears many hats in her role as a social justice promoter. Um, she is one of the women blazing new trails through her work in trust-based philanthropy. I have to say that Dimple has some Texas roots, Austin roots, I should say. She is a graduate of UT Austin, after which she left us to go to other schools and other parts of the country. Pia Infante is the director, the co-executive director of the Whitman Institute and another champion of the trust-based philanthropy ideas. Uh, she is actually on the steering committee. She's the chair of the steering committee of the Trust-Based Philanthropy Project, which is an ambitious project to rewrite philanthropy for the 21st century. Pia is again, uh, nationally recognized for her work just like Dimple is, but she brings multiple talents um, to, um, her work, including being a school teacher, an organizational development consultant, a nonprofit manager, and just a real believer in our collective imagination and our power to redesign philanthropy through relationships to center the people we serve. And while I have seen many changes in Impact Austin over the many years that I've been a member, there is one thing about Impact Austin that never changes, and that is that we are a learning organization. And in that spirit, I am honored to welcome two women who are learning, growing, and teaching, and spreading ideas that are so important for philanthropy, especially given the time we're in. So without further ado, I'm going to pose my first question to um, Pia. 
Pia, tell us a little bit about trust-based philanthropy. What is that? You are on mute, Pia. Ah, thank you, Mita. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's quite an honor to be here. And this is a great question to start with. As I was um, watching and listening to the introduction, it occurred to me that the roots of trust-based philanthropy are very similar to your roots in collective giving. So the democratic principles, right, of being in collaboration and partnership. And I think essentially one of trust-based philanthropy's purposes is to reimagine a culture of giving in philanthropy where we see our partners not as, um, what is it? Uh, not as sort of sort of ch charity cases for us to fix, but actually partners and collaborators in the social innovations that we really require in this century, whether we're talking about education or economy or climate um, or government. So I think essentially that's what it is. There are some core principles you can see on, you know, in the materials, which have to do with like multi-year long-term funding, um, sort of not having a lot of bureaucratic um, technicalities between the, the giver and the receivers. Um, and really, I think essentially partnering in a spirit of service. So that's, you know, I wanted to give you a really succinct answer so we could get some of the components of it, but I think I'll start there and maybe, and let Dimple into the conversation. Thank you so much, Pia. Dimple, may I ask you the same question, uh, just to elaborate on how you see trust-based philanthropy, both uh, from the perspective of your organization and from your past experience? Sure. Um, so thank you, Mita, and thanks to Impact Austin. Um, you know, I will just say we all spend so much time on Zoom these days, um, but this call, I, I really feel like we're all together. So I, I, I can feel the power of this collective and of all these women who are working together to make Austin a better place, and it's inspiring. Um, so to answer kind of that question about trust-based philanthropy, I'll just quickly give some context about the General Service Foundation. So we are a family foundation that's been around for 73 years. Um, and our mission is to fund work that um, will ensure that everyone can thrive and everyone belongs. So we see ourselves as really funding justice work. And Trust-based philanthropy for us is an expression of our values. It's an expression of our beliefs. So we have a value around partnership and a deep desire to be in partnership with those that we support. And so trust-based philanthropy it kind of reflects that partnership for us. Um, we believe that the people who are best positioned to make change are those that are impacted by the problems that they're trying to solve. We think that, that the wisdom and the leadership should come from those who are most impacted. And so trust-based philanthropy for us is about centering the grantees, centering those who are most impacted and not sort of substituting kind of our own sense from, from sort of far away in our foundation about the work. That's wonderful. Uh, talking about partnerships, so let's dig into that a little bit. What, is, what does it mean to partner with a grantee, a grant partner, when you are a um, space philanthropist? Because essentially, you are always uh, the person with power at some level, because it is up to you to decide whether this partnership happens or not. How do you see, what exactly do you do? Let's start at the beginning, Pia, and talk about what that would look like in grant making. Yeah, and I think it expresses itself differently in different mediums. So I can speak to our foundation, which is the Whitman Institute. We are spending out um, by the end of 2021. And we think of ourselves as a proactive grant maker and in terms of the areas that we fund. So we fund, we have funded in civic engagement and some human rights and journalism. So knowing the areas that we want to have some impact in or some collaboration in, we are proactive in terms of seeking out partners. Meaning we don't actually have an open application process because we don't have the staff 
um, robustness to review thousands of applications. It may look like equity to say we have an open application process, but because we fund nationally, we know that that would be a waste of time for a lot of folks to fill out an application that we already know from the outset we couldn't um, meet the demand. So we examined our grant making and we, we brought a few lenses at the front of it. And one is that we know that less than 3% of all funding goes to uh, black, indigenous and Latino leaders of organizations. So while organizations may be serving those populations, we look specifically at it, who's in executive leadership and also who are on the boards of the, of the organizations. Because again, we're looking at power. So if, so if that's a front lens, we hold that and we hold, we also held for ourselves, we were looking for organizations with budgets of a million dollars or less. And so we would proactively find partners through publicly held information. So our due diligence was on our side. It's called, we do the homework. So we take on that work instead of having our burnt out, stressed out um, nonprofit partners who are doing a million things um, have to take on that burden and prove their sort of um, proof of concept to us. So already you can hear the power dynamic shifting in that kind of process, right? There's already a sensibility that we understand and empathize with the conundrums of being, say, a youth development or a, a journalism organization um, in the time of COVID, in the time like 2020 that had multiple pandemics of economy and politics and global health all at once. So we do that. And then we approach partners. And by the time we've approached a partner for a conversation, we're, we're about 90% sure what we're likely to fund them. The last 10% has to do with our experiential understanding if we have shared values, going back to Dimple's point. Do we share values around uh, the most important um, things, around equity, about, around humility, around um, listening to feedback of our constituents, feeling like having accountability to those communities. Do we share those values? And I think also a characteristic we often look for and that we could probably find in some of the winners of your awards are is real humility and, and not these personality and charisma driven outfits, but really a humility around leadership. And, and going back again to partnership and collaboration, leaders who are essentially facilitative leaders that at the heart of them, they're servant leaders, they're, they're leaders who lift up everyone around them, right? So we seek that kind of leadership. So that already sounds pretty different. And I know it looks different in different contexts, but that's just a little window into our proactive grant making. And we call that do the homework for the Whitman Institute. And then just take it a few steps further. Then we're now in a relationship that we think of as a relationship of learning, not a relationship or of proof of proof, right? So meaning we're in the relationship not to chalk up some metrics of impact on a report card and tally them and use that tally to then um, support some claims of our own impact or grade a potential a partner for further funding. We're in a relationship of learning and things that we'll learn are what does it take to really create the change we're trying to see? What are they learning? How are they failing? How can we support them? And through that relationship, we start to see, is this, um, does this look like a long-term relationship? It's a little bit like dating, but for many foundations, you have to date them and never get a scent. <laughs> I think for us, you know, we, we, we have this sort of dating period in the first year or two of, of our connection. And then we start to see, is there synergy here? Are we trying to advance the same things in the world? And if so, then, then, then they could become likely, um, and for us, we had a limited, you know, budget size. So there were there 15 for us, but uh, long-term or multi-year partners. So um, because we had the front ending, uh, the front end lenses around equity, um, we don't we don't end up in the boat of um, some critiques could be well, maybe you're just picking favorites, or it's just people. Uh, already know, already like. We in fact sign um, uh, legal agreements that we will never, you know, offer to fund friends or family members or organizations that we have deep relationships with already. So we're we try to solve for some of the sort of normal issues around due diligence and good fit with a real acknowledgement that we have the time and capacity often where um, nonprofits don't. And I, I often argue that wouldn't we rather spend the time in relationship conversation and learning rather than behind our laptops reading proposals and reports? Like, isn't that a more appealing way anyway um, to live into the human dimension that we're all attracted to in this work? 
so before I go to Dimple, I want to pursue one question. When you said you do your due diligence, uh, you do 90% of the work yourself. Do you think about it from the perspective of your staff? What are your lived experiences and how do you put that team together for the due diligence? Mm -hmm. I feel like you're also asking if we're looking at our own implicit biases, which is a great question. Um, you know, we, it's, we have a really limited staff size. So that's why we, um, we have, one of the things we did when I became the co-executive director six years ago is we transitioned our board to one that is very diverse so that our eyes and ears and experiences and networks are all really diverse. And they're diverse in a lot of ways, you know, gender, race, experience education. So we have folks who work in tech, you know, folks who work in documentary filmmaking, folks who work in more traditional humanities, uh, folks who run foundations. So there's something around the, and this maybe speaks to the giving circle set of eyes when looking at um, applications. We have really diversifies the set of eyes that refer in and mm -hmm. that review. Um, and also, you know, John and I are the co-EDs and we, between us, you know, represent a bunch of different demographics, you know, um, in that way as well. So I think we, we have the limitations that we have um, in terms of our size, but we are, we are cognizant and conscious of things like implicit bias and things um, like just one little story is when I first became co-ED, we realized that 70% um, of the nonprofits we were funding were led by white women. And John, that was, you know, he's a lovely um, white man, uh, feminist white man, and, and he didn't even see that, you know, that um, it was for him, it's like he, he really was happy to fund women, which we always are, but he didn't have the, a second lens on that. So again, just even bringing me into the picture really helped us um, to see that. Yeah, yeah, no, and I, 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 it was really, you know, given how much deep experience you have and John has, um, it's totally a different story between different foundations, but there is that issue of how do we do this well, even as we are bringing grant partners into the process and reducing the burden on them. So to you, Dimple, how do you see this and how far has your homework gone on your end yeah. to reduce the burden on your grant partners? So Mita, I heard you say um, before Pia's question that you know you referred to the, the power imbalance that exists yes. between grantees and their funders. And you know, it it absolutely does. And I guess what I would say is for us, we um, we use trust-based approaches because we urgently want our grantees to be powerful. And so in the context of that power imbalance, we're intentional about not wanting to hoard additional power. And so concretely what that looks like is things like um, having our default grant be a general operating support grant as opposed to a project support grant. So when we give a general operating support grant, we're actually giving our grantees the power to decide how and when they use those funds, right? And we have all just sort of lived through a year that has had multiple crises that none of us could have foreseen, mm -hmm. right? But traditional philanthropic practice, you know, essentially requires grantees to come in the door and present us sort of their, um, you know, their magic ball where they've looked into the future and said, here's everything that's going to happen next year. And here's what we're going to do. And then what happens is when those conditions change, then the grantees are calling us again, right? And they're having to say, well, you know, there's a pandemic now and we can't do this conference that we said we were going to do or whatever the situation is. Those are all the ways in which project grants are, are kind of limiting the power that grantees have. Right? Whereas when we give general flexible support, we're saying we trust you, which is super important. But more than that, we're actually giving them the power to move in ways that they need to, to lead their communities in the way that they need to. Another example like this is um, giving, grant, grant, giving our grantees a runway. So um, when I got to the General Service Foundation, 
a large percentage of our grants were actually one-year grants. One-year grants are a tremendous amount of work, not just for us as funders, but more importantly for our grantees, right? They're having to come back every year and ask us for funding and having to sort of go through the cycle of proving their expertise and their worth every year. And so what we have um, moved towards is defaulting towards two to three year grants, which gives grantees this longer runway. And when I think about the power that that gives them, it gives them the power to imagine more long-term change and actually move towards it because they don't have to kind of break everything down into like what can be accomplished in a year. Um, so those are, I think those two pieces of general operating flexible support, long-term support, those are two that um, I think both Pia and I would love to see be the norm mm -hmm. um, because they, they concretely shift what our grantees are able to do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So before I run, uh, ask my other couple of questions, I'd like to invite the audience to propose questions. And I believe Nicole is keeping track of them. I'd love to take those to our uh, wonderful guests here. It doesn't have to be me just asking the questions, but I have tons of questions if no one else wants to ask them. Um, I think, you know, one of the, it's, Partnerships, stepping out of your networks, giving multi-year grants, um, doing the homework yourselves. From a collective giving perspective, we do have that massive talent and the diverse perspectives. But on the other hand, keeping the thrill of giving a grant is also something that we try to work with because our members want to be involved. And uh, how do you how do you think about this? Let's say we want we wanted to tell a new member they should really get excited about this, and we're doing multi year grants and we're doing operating grants. What would how would you frame this conversation? I know this is a very tough question. Yeah. yeah. You know, and uh, but you know what what are some of the things that excite you perhaps about this and uh, maybe ex excite you when you talk to others because I know both of you are huge advocates of trust based and you are uh, doing this all the time with your own organizations and leading it outside. Mm -hmm. What is the story we tell people with trust-based philanthropy? So, I mean, one, I, to me, one thing that's exciting is I think trust-based philanthropy invites us to sort of reckon with what is the right role mm -hmm. of the philanthropist in the social change world. Right? And that I think that is that is something that's shifting. So I think um, a, a kind of more traditional approach to philanthropy said that you know the right role of the funder or the philanthropist who's part of the giving circle is that they are the ones with expertise, um, that they are the ones who are setting a strategy. Um, and then the grantees are kind of the ones that they contract out to to implement the strategy. Right, and so in that way, you can see how much power sits with the funder. To me, what's so exciting is to, is to kind of start really questioning that and, and to say that the role of the funder or the, the, you know, the person who's doing the giving is to uh, learn and to listen to those who are actually on the ground doing the work. So there's still a really exciting role. Like when you talked about the thrill of grant making, I think you know Pia and I both experience that in our in our jobs all the time. But the thrill comes from the quality of the relationships that we have an opportunity to build. Um, and it's it's the it's the learning, it's the partnership, it's the being of service. That's a thrill, and not necessarily the kind of exercising the power of the purse. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, and can I add to that? And I see a couple of questions, I'll try to tackle one. So I would also say that the, the thrill of the award is a little bit of a construct that we create, right? These folks are gonna do their incredible work with women and girls or, or whatever their focus is, um, they're gonna do that. 
Um, they're going to have highs and lows. They're going to have to pivot during really difficult times like COVID. Um, so their work is already pretty thrilling, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so we create kind of another structure and then the, the thrill is then for us to feel good about helping them. Yeah. So I think Trust-Based Anthony sort of proposes, what if we didn't have to create this other structure to be um, passionate and excited about change work? You know, what if we had such a deep relationship, which, which I know that Dimple and I do with our partners that they call us when hard news comes down the line. They call us and they say, we didn't get that big grant from Ford. You know, um, I feel really burnt out today as a mom, as a, you know, as a nonprofit executive, as a development, I have to be the development director at the same time. So for us, I think that the, I have a thrill around the, the learning, because I, I do not run an entity on the ground. Like, I'll give you an example. We have a, a, a grantee partner in Napa Valley, and they normally do incredible work with foster youth, creating their own kind of social innovation vehicles. Every time a major fire comes through Santa Rosa, which now happens every other year, they go from doing that kind of incredible high quality, you know, kind of young, uh, young adult programming and turn immediately to being kind of a center for all of these um, undocumented workers who are now homeless, really nervous about um, housing security and job security and don't trust the county to not deport them um, when they go in to get fire services. So if we didn't give them this kind of funding, that our, this nonprofit partner of ours would be worried that they weren't meeting our um, metric goals for youth development when they're literally getting flooded with homeless families of migrant workers who need direct help translating the services that the county is trying to provide, but there's a lot of culture and language barriers. They serve as the actual translator and interloper for county and federal services for you know um, a climate chaos. Mm -hmm. So to me, that the helping them be able to do that and then hearing what it means to the staff to have been able to do that and then hearing from the families um, afterwards about what it meant that they could go to this safe place to figure themselves out for the next few months as they reimagine re their whole lives. That's, to me, that, that has a different kind of thrill than like, yay, yes, I get to give an award. Not, not to discount that I love, I want to be helpful. It's, it's asking the people that we're helping, how do you want to be helped? And I can guarantee you a million percent of the time, they're not going to say, can you please create another structure for us to compete in to get dollars we need to pay our staff? You know, they're not going to say that. Um, I just want to say, uh, and, and Dimple, I really love your idea about what, what is the right role of a philanthropist. There was a good question in here is like, how do we apply this to giving circles? You know, giving circles have their own design already and it's democratic and participatory by design. I think that's a great question that I don't know that I am the best one to answer. I wonder about opening up that question to you and to your awardees and asking into the, your values in terms of the giving circles how would you design a trust-based giving circle process? Who would you include in the design process, not just the decisions about where the money goes? I think that's where we're trying to get to with trust-based philanthropy too. We can do inclusive design in a thousand different ways. But if, again, we go back to Dimple's point, the folks at the table are not the ones directly experiencing that issue and directly trying to counteract that in their actual lived experience, whether you know, on, on whatever scale we're talking about and whatever issue we're, or we're talking about, then we're not getting to um, shifting the power dynamic. And can I just address one more question? Sure. Jerry asked, um, as wonderful as this sounds, how do you manage accountability? Sadly, there are those who would take advantage. And I think, Jerry, I gave you kind of a flippant answer, which is like, nonprofits are not the place for con artists. You're just like, it's not a great, you know, go to Las Vegas, but, but, I, I think in terms of accountability, we have, you know, once we, once we get into that relationship, we don't close our eyes and say, now all of a sudden we're not observing and we're not experiencing what's happening. There have been times where we were in a, a multi-year relationship with a nonprofit partner and we 
And we got concerned about how they were doing a leadership transition. Their executive director left. They went into a 12 or 14 month process to hire a new ED. And then they ended up appointing the board chair, the executive director, which felt very murky to us around transparency and sort of what happened with like an, this equitable process for hire. Um, so I think the accountability then gets managed in the same way we might imagine an accountability in a relationship, you know? It's, you know, hey, I just wanna ask about this. What was going on behind closed doors there? I just, I'm just curious, you know, like I wanna understand what's happening. So um, in that instance, we actually decided the next year to part ways because just there's something about that leadership transition that didn't feel values aligned for us. So it's not that trust-based philanthropy is about sort of blindly um, and, and being undiscerning in our relationships. I, in fact, I say no a lot more than I say yes in trust-based philanthropy because I don't take calls or meetings or you know in the past coffee dates and now Zoom dates um, like letting people think that they have a chance, you know, at getting a grant. I will say right now we have committed all of our funds because we're spending out. So I, I'm just very transparent. And so saying no and the, the, the muscle to say no and the muscle to design our process to be realistic um, so that there aren't people sort of expecting or hoping for some funds from us that are just not gonna get it. I think part of um, brokering trust from this position of power is realizing that if we're not completely transparent, the opaqueness of our intentions can be misread in about a million different ways, you know? Yeah. And so I think if anyone wants to call themselves trust-based to their community, they're gonna wanna be very transparent about what they mean by that. Yeah. And we don't have a singular answer. As you can tell from me and Dimple's responses, our foundations don't operate exactly the same. No, absolutely. There are not. There are many good ways of doing great trust-based philanthropy. Um, we are running out of time. Uh, before I let Dimple just end our conversation for now, uh, would you two mind answering some additional questions in chat because we can't get them answered here oh, sure. on the panel? Thank you so much. But Dimple, any last thoughts about any advice to our members about uh, personal work you've had to do to get here? Hmm. Or, um, or following up on Pia's comments as well. So, I, you know, I guess what I would say as a as a last thought is, um, you know, our experience at General Service Foundation is is that trust based philanthropy has, at its core, it's allowed us to increase the effectiveness and sustainability of our grantees, hmm. um, and that's one of the reasons that you know, we are excited to share our experience with others. So it's not, you know, we share it because I feel like it's both made us better grant makers, but it's made our grantees able to do their their work in a way that's, that's more supported. So, um, you know, what I would share is like, there are, there are just simple things that um, donors can do to kind of look at your own practices, look at your own processes, and, and ask yourselves, you know, are we doing, is, is our application process set up this way because this is, you know, how all funders do it? Or is it, is it set up this way because this really helps the effectiveness and sustainability of our grantees? And, you know, for us asking those questions led to so much change that's been so positive um, and that has been so affirmed by our grantees. You said the other day, best practices just become habits after a while. They need to be looked at. And that was- Yeah, or no, I, I said that um, it's that a lot of the things we think of as philanthropic best practices are really just habits. Yes. They're not, it's not that there's like some science there that, you know, um, a grant application needs to ask 82 questions. Right. That's just a habit. It's just yes. what our sector does. Yeah. But, but we can change those habits. Absolutely, thank you. Pia wanted to say, uh, I have one more comment here. Okay. Forgive me, I just have a 30 second comment. 30 seconds, it's been yeah. delightful. Thank you, Mita and Dimple. Um, Christine, I wanna go back to something you said in the introduction, which is what a year of, of being apart together. And it made me think of this country and this last election and how sometimes we're so close together and we're so far apart, you know? Yeah. Um, and I really believe that um, in order to lean into that dissonance and that tension in this country, right? The, the level of the apartness together and, and how 
we all kind of individually and institutionally hold that tension in reality. Yeah. I think the truth is we're gonna have to be uncomfortable sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I think what trust-based philanthropy and anything that questions our own individual embodiment of power or our institutional decisions of power, there's gonna be some discomfort in examining that and interrogating that and being truthful about that. But I think we believe that if we're able to do that and we're able to do that with a spirit of real service um, and, and, and compassion and, and um, intention, um, then we can, maybe, we can maybe add to the climate that we'd like to have in this country, which is I don't think we wanna be so close together and so far apart. You know, so if we can inch towards um, a different cultural imagination about how to be, even in our most micro decisions, I think we believe that it is possible to get to a better place together. So thank you. Great thought to end on. Thank you so much, uh, Pia. Thank you, Dimple.